Okay. How many people we got? We got 25 people. That's probably good enough. Um, yeah. Can you guys see my shirt? Okay. Good. Yeah. Welcome everybody to the last class of metaprogramming ever. Um, I've broken out my my uh, Python shirt for the occasion. This is how I started. Um, you know. So feels good to be back in it. Um, I'm also not standing up anymore because that did not work so well. So I'm sitting down. I can't put my hands in my pockets anymore, but that's probably a good thing. Um, so I'll go ahead and share my screen and we can get to it. Oh, wait a sec, is this going to work? Share screen. Can you guys see the slides or not? Did I mess that up? Good? Okay. Cool. Yeah, so this is the last lecture of metaprogramming. Um, so what we're going to do is I'm going to cover some stuff that we didn't cover in the class. I'm just going to go over kind of the holes that there were. And then I'm going to go over everything we did cover really briefly. Um, just as a review, kind of a conclusion, just so you guys can have it fresh in your heads for the very intense final exam that will conclude this lecture. So everybody make sure you're paying very close attention because this man, you know, this is a brutal final. Um, a lot of people end up failing because of the final. So just watch out. Um, so anyway, let's get started. Uh, what didn't we cover? So first off, we didn't cover homoiconicity. Um, and this is because it's a property of languages that Python does not have. Um, you know, I try to make this class as much as possible a Python class. We dipped into some uh, compiled languages briefly, but that was okay because you guys hopefully had a little bit of experience with at least one of those compiled languages. A lot of people don't have experience with Lisp, and Lisp is the classic homoiconicity example. Um, so I wanted to cover it, but ultimately I think it just would have been too much for me to try to teach the syntax of a whole new language and we're already strapped for time. I'd like to say that maybe it was because of coronavirus. That's why I didn't get around to it, but that's a lie. I just, I could have, I could have done it, but I just didn't, but I think it wouldn't have fit very well. So that's, that's the, that's the real excuse. Um, but just so you guys know, homoiconicity is a huge part of metaprogramming and it's a property of languages where the format of the code matches the format of the data in the code. So what this would look like if Python were homo, icon, homo iconistic, then you could imagine all Python programs would have to be represented as lists or something. Because in Python, you have a list literal, you surround something with square brackets and then whatever's inside is a list. You can imagine writing a Python program as just a big list of strings or something, maybe where the strings are the, are the statements that you want to execute or something like that. Um, if you wrote a Python program like that, then it would be kind of homoiconistic because you would be representing the code in exactly the same format, the, the same literals that you represent data in the same language. Um, but that's not really how we write Python, so Python isn't homoiconistic. Uh, but there are some languages that are uh, machine code is one. So machine code is just binary. It's just hex or ones and zeros. Um, your computer knows how to interpret that binary as code. Um, but uh, the um, and but and also data in in machine code is also just binary. It's just bits. You just address some bytes. Um, so data and code in machine language are the same thing. So machine code is homoiconistic. And you can actually appreciate some of the meta-ness of that in um, what you have to do in a, an assignment like IBCM. If you've done 2150, when you do IBCM, you end up inserting code into the program by loading part of the program as data and changing it and then um, uh, loading that data back into the program itself. 
that's possible because the program and data are represented the same way. So that's an example right there of some of the meta stuff that comes when you have home iconicity. And then the other big example is Lisp. So Lisp, in Lisp, all programs are lists. And, but then also you have list literals in the, in the program too. So down here, we have an example of Lisp. This is actually from a language called Hy, H-Y. Um, it's a Lisp dialect that compiles down to Python abstract syntax tree. So um, if you want to mess around with Lisp and, you're, and you want to do it in kind of a Python-y um, way, I totally recommend Hi. It's very cool. Um, and you can even like take that compiled abstract syntax tree and decompile it into Python source code. So you can like switch back and forth between this Lisp expression and um, Python. Uh, one of the cool things about Lisp is it uses high, uh, homoiconicity to give you a feature called um, macros. This is somewhat different from the macros in C++. In C++, the macros were just text substitution. But in Lisp, the macro uh, actually takes in some program as a list because the, the, the uh, program is just a list. So it takes in a list, but the macro assumes that that list represents a program. And so you can see here, this is the form of some program as a list. And then you can perform transformations on that program and output a new program. So you, you can see here this quote, this quote character, what that's actually doing is it's making the rest of this statement a literal list. But you can tell that this list is a program. So this macro is actually doing program substitution at a list level instead of a text substitution level. Um, so this is pretty cool. And just, uh, I found this example in the high source code. And this is actually part of a mechanism that does program transformations to do tail call optimization. If you've heard of that, it makes it so that you can do recursion. If you do it in a certain way, you can do recursion without the costs of um, pushing onto the stack every time. It transforms your recursive uh, function into an iterative function for you. That's part of, that's what this macro is part of. And that's kind of the cool, one of the cool things you can do with macros is you can kind of change the language. You can extend the language. So anyway, this is Lisp. I would love to have get, gotten more into it, but um, just a quick overview will, will suffice, I guess. So questions about home iconicity? I don't expect there probably are many considering just kind of briefly talked about it. Okay. Um, we didn't talk about very much compiled stuff. We did kind of do like one day of compile time computation, but there's really a lot of stuff to get into there. Um, there's a language called D and um, Professor Tychonovich, the sponsoring professor for this class, um, loves D. And um, it would have been really fun to incorporate D into this lecture. But again, like Lisp, it's just a little too hard to introduce the syntax of a whole new language in a one credit class like this. So, um, but be aware that there's a lot of compile time computation stuff, a lot of compiled metaprogramming out there. And um, it, when you talk to some people, this is what they think of as metaprogramming. I think, I think of dynamic Python runtime stuff, but um, there's a lot of stuff here. Um, and then we could have also talked more about compilers themselves, but that requires some theory of computation. Um, and also it's just a lot. So we didn't really go there. Um, the last thing that we didn't really do very much of is we didn't do very many applications. Um, you know, in this class, since it's just one hour every week, I end up just kind of throwing examples up at the screen, but none of them really form a whole ecosystem of where this stuff actually would become useful. Um, they exist, um, they're just big and um, they're hard to cover in just one hour every week. But be aware that if you want like a single example of almost every single thing we talked about in this lecture, browse through the Django source code. It's, it's mind blowing. Uh, they incorporate, I think, almost every single meta thing we talked about. Um, so Django, Jinja, we talked a little bit about Jinja. Um, if you go into the source code, I, Rest assured, you will find lots of metaprogramming. Uh, Docopt and Invoke 
These are um, Python packages that turn documentation, your, your doc string in a Python file into code that makes that Python file a command line utility. So you can say in your doc string, uh, this, this is meant to be run from the command line and it has these options. And if then doc opt will transform that Python file into a command line utility that takes in those options and passes them into your code as like function parameters or something. Really cool, super handy. Names, tuple and data classes. We briefly mentioned these, but if you look into how they work, they're very meta. So lots of applications here that we just didn't get into. Uh, so keep your eyes peeled. The stuff is out there and it is useful even though most of our examples were toy examples. Questions about applications? Okay. So, okay. That's what we didn't cover. What did we cover? We talked about making our own objects. This was in the first lecture. Um, people had experience with Python. People had experience with object-oriented object programming, but not necessarily the combination. So uh, we covered the combination classes, objects, methods, kind of the, the essentials. And then that led us into inheritance because you can't do object-oriented programming without inheritance. And we learned about the specific algorithm that Python uses to resolve multiple inheritance. I hope that was kind of interesting. It's not technically metaprogramming, but it, it's uh, really cool. Um, and this algorithm, and it still blows my mind. Um, and then that kind of led us into a discussion about super. And then this was very meta. Um, I, hope, I hope you guys remember at least some of this. Um, super ended up being um, kind of a crazy function. First of all, it wasn't a function, it was a class. And then it did meta stuff like peeking on the call stack to find out what self is so that you don't have to pass it in. Um, and it investigates the MRO, which is this runtime representation of multiple inheritance. Um, yeah, super is a crazy function, um, but we don't have to think about that. So we can just call it and it works most of the time if we kind of understand the MRO in general. So I hope, hope the MRO was revealing to at least some people. Uh, we talked about functions as objects. Um, so, you know, we, we had variables and we assigned a function itself to the variable, not calling the function, but just the name of the function, the function itself. We can assign those to variables. We can pass them into functions. We can return them from functions. And then that kind of led into closures because the ability to return functions and use functions as variables and define functions within functions uh, reveals this kind of loophole where you can have scopes that refer to enclosing scopes even once the enclosing scope has disappeared. And this is a closure. Um, enclosures, again, while not technically metaprogramming, led us into decorators. Uh, because a decorator is really just a closure. It's a function that wraps another function and returns a transformed version of the original function. And assuming that transformation has a reference to the original one, then a decorator is most likely a closure in some form. Um, decorators ended up coming up a fair amount and that's because decorators are metaprogramming. Um, because you're transforming code at runtime, We've, a decorator is a metaprogram in a, in a sense. If you think of a function as a program and the thing that it's decorating as a program, then this is a metaprogram. Um, and decorators are handy for all sorts of things. Um, yeah, so the, the decorator example here is just the implementation of a decorator, but then we also talked about how to use them with the at syntax and that got sufficiently complicated once we started using partial as a decorator. And then we wanted to use partial and only partial to decorate something and bind one of its arguments. And I don't know if you guys remember, but I think we ended up calling partial on partial and partial. And I hope now that kind of sounds familiar um, because that ended up being very similar to what we did in language metaprogramming with the specializer. Um, yeah. We talked about the type function, which isn't a function, it's a class. 
And we went through this kind of mind blowing exercise of realizing that the type of a thing is its class, but then the type of the class is type. Um, and then that begs the question, well, what's the type of type? And we end up getting stuck. Um, and that's because we discovered the meta, meta class protocol and how um, not only do objects have a type, but types are objects. And so they must also have a type. So there's kind of a second level of typing and that's on a different dimension than subclassing. We have our inheritance diagram kind of visually in front of us, but then also above it, we have the uh, meta class dimension where the classes themselves, their behavior is defined by yet other classes. Uh, we talked a little bit about reflection. Um, the coolest reflection I think is exec and eval in globals and locals. Um, but there was a lot of reflection. We, um, there's almost too much to talk about, which is why I framed the reflection lecture as just a, an exercise in trying to implement something like a debugger in Python. Um, because really it's impossible to go through every little bit of reflection um, that's available in Python. But we, we saw a bunch of cool stuff, including exec and eval, globals and locals. And if you remember, that's actually how we implemented the feature of the debugger where you could change variables at runtime in a function that isn't yours, um, which ended up being kind of crazy um, and probably not recommended. But then we ended up combining reflection with um, some attribute lookup code that we investigated. So in, in Python, accessing attributes is not as simple as just, um, you know, saying dot and then the name of the thing and Python goes and fetches that thing. Sometimes it's that simple, but for some attributes, Python um, actually follows this much more complex protocol called the descriptor protocol. And that's actually how methods are implemented in Python. A method is actually a, an instance of function and it's a class attribute, but it implements the descriptor protocol so that when it's looked up on an object, it actually gets transformed into a method at that point. Um, we used this protocol in order to do some cool stuff, including we, we made it a type checked um, instance, uh, a type checked class attribute, so that instances of this class if you try to assign something to one of these attributes, but it's the wrong type, it'll actually throw a type error, which is kind of cool. It's something that people don't think that is really possible in Python because Python is so loosely typed. But the fact that it exposes this protocol to us is both meta and uh, pretty useful because you can see here, we've, we've kind of created a framework here where um, we only accept things that are acceptable in the framework. And then we were able to expand on this, combining the three things we had previously talked about. We've got reflection, we've got meta classes, and we've got um, descriptors, all kind of combined in a meta class here that generated init functions for us. Um, and it used reflection to dynamically execute that code in the class body. Um, we used some code generation to generate the, the, the um, the init function in the first place. Um, and we use meta classes to actually bake this into a, a class st uh, structure, a framework, um, so that everything in that framework followed these rules here. Everything had a, a default init function. And that was definitely a pretty crazy slide. I'm sure I lost a lot of people there, but I'd like to show everything coming together and really um, actually being useful for something that you could actually imagine being thankful for. So a, an automatic init function, uh, pretty useful, pretty useful. Uh, we briefly talked about some compile time computation. This was a slide from that. This was some Java um, where we used the at syntax, which in Python is a decorator to actually do some metadata. And then we had, um, metadata processors, annotation processors that use this metadata to actually insert code. And if you remember, this was actually code from one of those annotation processors 
annotated by itself. So there were some cool meta things there. We didn't go too much into it, but um, there's certainly a lot to be said for compile time metadata, compile time annotation processing. And then we switched into C++. Uh, we talked about macros at first, but we kind of saw that macros aren't great. Um, they're often very confusing. They have weird behavior because of their simplicity. They're just text substitution. So you have to be very careful with them. Um, but then we switched into talking about templates and we discovered that templates are actually Turing complete in C++ and you can write templated code that will at compile time generate anything because it's Turing complete. And so like here we have a compile time factorial function such that when you use it, you actually get a factorial value that doesn't have to be computed at runtime. It was actually generated dynamically as code at compile time. And then we had a really cool lecture on language metaprogramming. We stepped up a level. Um, we talked about compilers and how you make a compiler from scratch. And it turns out that both compilers themselves are metaprograms, but also how you make them is kind of meta because you can't just make them from scratch or at least not very easily. You, you have to start from something that you can do, some other language or assembly straight up, and you have to build a simple or reduced compiler there. And then you write the compiler in its own language, which is meta. I think, I don't know, it seems meta. Um, and then you compile that compiler with your original compiler. And then you probably do that again to double benefit, to double dip. Uh, and then you can do this again. You can improve your compiler in its own source code and then you double benefit again. And that's how we end up with really, really advanced compilers. A uh, fun fact, I was cleaning up my computer yesterday and um, getting rid of some of the old stuff that I had for classes that was just taking up a bunch of space on my hard drive. And I deleted Clang that I had installed from source that I had compiled from source. I compiled Clang from source on my computer for a class at one point. Um, first of all, compiling a compiler from source is already a meta process. I mean, you can see how that's meta. I used, I think GCC, um, to compile Clang, but they're written in the same language. Clang, some of the Clang source code was in C and C++. Um, and then what's more is after compiling it, the entire Clang folder on my computer was 50 gigabytes. Um, and if you've ever written a, a huge amount of code, you'll recognize that even huge amounts of code aren't 50 gigabytes. I mean, 50, you know, huge, huge projects take up kilobytes, maybe megabytes, um, because source code is ultimately a very compact source of information. I mean, text is very compact. So the fact that Clang was 50 gigabytes on my hard drive just goes to show how far we've come on in compilers. I mean, um, and it's, nobody can sit down and write 50 gigabytes worth of code. Uh, this, that's a result of years and years and years of bootstrapping. So just fun anecdote. It's gone now. I deleted it because I already have playing. I don't need it compiled from source. So, uh, okay. Then we talked about uh, Fudamura projections, which use this um, new machine that we introduced called a specializer that does partial evaluation. It's kind of somewhere between a compiler and an interpreter. It takes a program and some of its input and it interprets the parts that it can and it compiles the rest into some shortened version of the same program. Uh, so it's between a compiler and an interpreter. And we saw that um, specializers kind of take us to this weird place where we start specializing themselves on themselves, which we can do because programs are data and when you have a program that takes in a program um, or data, you can just pass, like, it, every combination becomes possible here because a specializer takes in both programs and data. Literally anything we could pass into this bucket. We could pass in, you know, one, two, three, four, five, or we could pass in a compiler because programs are just data. 
um, we saw that specializing a specializer on itself ended up giving us a compiler compiler, some machine that takes in interpreters and outputs compilers, which is just nuts because where we don't even see a compiler or an interpreter here, but somehow exercising this machine on itself and itself gives us this other machine. And it's because a specializer is kind of a combination of an interpreter and a compiler. I hope this was thoroughly mind blowing. It's still mind blowing for me. Every time I do this, I have to spend a couple hours just standing here like, wait a sec. So this does, why does, why does this work? And it's not shown on this slide, but we had a whole series of slides just to build up to this big one. So any questions about what we covered this, this, uh, this um, semester? Okay, I'm sure if you guys have questions, just uh, you know, hit me up. But uh, we better get started on this final exam because you guys only have oof, 20 minutes. Oh boy, I, I went a little long there, sorry. We'll see if you guys finish. Um, so the final exam, uh, I'd like you guys to email me um, feedback on the lectures. So uh, what was your favorite lecture? What was your least favorite lecture? Were they fun? Were they educational? And you know, feel free to elaborate here. You know, just I appreciate not just a yes, no answer to all of these. Um, uh, did I go too fast or too slow? It's hard for me to tell. Sometimes I feel like I'm going really fast. And then I watch the lecture and I'm like, oh my gosh, she's talking so slow. So I don't know. So I'm curious what you guys think, um, too fast or too slow. Uh, let me know what you thought of the homeworks. Um, last time I taught this class, I kind of put the homeworks on the back burner. I didn't really care about them. But then it turned out that everybody actually really liked the homeworks and they were a lot of people's favorite part of the class. So I tried to put a little bit more effort into them this time. Um, all of those runner files and the tester files, I wrote those over winter break to try to just make the homeworks more approachable. If that's what people are really getting out of the class, then I want them to be approachable. So uh, let me know what you thought about them. What was your favorite, least favorite? Were they fun? Because I did want them to be fun. But at the same time, I also wanted them to be helpful in learning the content. Um, were they hard or easy? Um, also peer grading. Uh, if you're, I don't know if you guys know, but as a student taught class, as part of the application every time, I have to come up with some new thing that I'm going to try, some like experiment. Uh, the experiment this time was peer grading. Last time it was in class group coding. Um, uh, so, you know, I'm curious what you guys thought of the peer grading. I think it was great because I didn't have nearly as much grading to do myself, and yet I'm still behind. But trust me, I was more behind last time I taught this class, so. Um, so I appreciate the, the help with grading, but from your guys' point of view, did you, was it stressful or did you, or was it valuable? Was the value worth the stress maybe? Or did you just forget every time? I don't know. So let me know what you thought of the peer grading. Um, so yeah, email me those things and any other comments you've got. Um, also this entire class, all the course materials were on GitHub in a repo. A and you'll notice that that was a public repo. So uh, star that thing, please. Um, uh, you know, I, I do put a lot of work into this class and I'm really proud of it. And so, you know, I want, um, I want that, uh, that repo to, I'd love it if people noticed the repo and people notice repos when they get stars and views and stuff. So um, just go star that thing. Um, if you want, I mean, you know, this is maybe I shouldn't have put this on the final exam slide because it's not like I'm going to grade you based on whether you start the final or start the start the repo, but I would appreciate it. Um, and similarly, all of the lecture recordings are on YouTube. Um, use those as a resource. Um, you know, I, again, I think we learned a lot and I, because it's just one hour every, every week. Um, stuff goes over people's heads, stuff goes over my head. Um, you know, I mess up questions and stuff. I, it goes fast. Um, but I hope that at least you kind of remember what we learned so that when it comes up later, you can be like, ah, oh, yeah, 
I did know this at one point. Let me go back. You can watch that lecture and maybe relearn it and do some really cool meta thing for some class or something. Uh, and then along those same lines, because I put a lot of work in this class, um, I, I'm really proud of those YouTube videos. And so, uh, you know, give me some likes and some uh, subscribe, you know, because um, just like the repo, I'm trying to go viral over here, you know, so, um, you know, interaction is good. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's the final. Um, Again, the GitHub thing and the YouTube thing are kind of optional. I would just really appreciate it, but, uh, but do email me. I, I will check for the emails. Um, you don't need to specify any special subject or anything. Just shoot me an email. You guys should all have my email. Um, and um, yeah, that's, uh, that's all I got for, um, for the class. So I hope you guys liked it. Um, yeah, that is my email on the chat. Yep, MTP4BE. Yeah, thanks. You guys were great. Um, I tried to elicit more questions this time, and I think you guys really did a great job of um, of doing that, of, of actually asking a lot of questions. Um, the question is, when should we email you the final exam by? I don't know, today? <laughs> uh, whenever. Um, the extra credit homework write-ups are due Wednesday night at Wednesday at five, I think. I think they're due Wednesday at five. Um, let's say this, uh, the final exam email is due at the same time. So Wednesday at five. Um, just because I want it fresh, you know, uh, I, that's one of the reasons I go over every lecture in this lecture is just because, you know, uh, want people to say what their favorite least favorite lectures were, which is easier if all of the lectures are fresh. So, um, yeah. Any other questions? Thanks. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for you guys. Um, this is a good way to uh, finish up last semester. So even though we had to go online, I feel like, honestly, it wasn't even that bad. Um, Kind of fun. I could put smaller code on the slides because you guys would actually have it on your screen. So it actually made slide making a little bit easier. So uh, if there's no other questions, I'm going to end lecture here. Um, this is all I had. So yeah, have a good one. Thanks. Thank Pat. you. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, thank you guys. All right, bye.